Beyond the Mic with Sean Dillon. We're joined on the storm line by an award-winning sports writer, author, and father. His first book, Love Zach, talks about a sport loved around the United States, football. He tries to answer this question, what happened to Zach Easter? We welcome Reed Forgrave. Sean, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Let's go beyond the mic. Reed, Love Zach is a passionate detective story written part cautionary tale and part love story. Is that how you would describe the book? Yeah, you know, to be honest, I, I love that what you lead with is is love story because it can be very easy to look at a book like this and say, oh, this is a book about concussions and football. I've read this book before. And this book's different because I think the biggest reason this book is different isn't just because it's about a 24-year-old man who's only played football since high school, suffered so many concussions, thought that he had CTE, and then died by suicide. Um, by the way, he was correct in thinking that he had CTE, which is which really disturbing to me as a, a, as a parent. But this is a love story, and it's a story about, in fact, like his mother and father and his girlfriend and how they tried so hard during the final month of Zach's life, when he was uh, really deteriorating, was going down the spiral, they tried so hard to stay, help save him from this disease. And ultimately, they did not succeed. But what's special about this story is that you hear Zach speaking in his own words from beyond the grave. Because he left behind all these journals. He left behind a, a typewritten autobiography of sorts uh, his family like, graciously uh, gave me and if you don't find all these text messages with his girlfriend that, that, that she gave me so you very much hear how much pain he's going through but how much love there is between himself and his family and his girlfriend and how they're trying so hard to save him and how ultimately he decided that he, he couldn't overcome this disease, but he very much wanted his story to go on, his legacy to live on, uh, to try to make the sport of football safer and make sure that no one else suffers the way that he did. Those were essentially his dying work. You've covered the NBA, NFL, college football, and basketball. Why was Zach's story so important for you to tell others? You know, when I first came across the story, it was in his obituary in the Des Moines Register, which actually I live in Minnesota now, but I used to live in Iowa. I used to work for that. And it was passed on to me by a friend. And I remember being absolutely jarred when I read this obituary because the final paragraph speaks in very frank words about the concussions he suffered in football and how this led to his, uh, to his descent. And I went into this, you know, the first time I spoke with his mother, Brenda Easter, was, I think it was the day after his funeral. It was right before Christmas of 2015. The first time that I went and hung out with his family in person was two weeks after that death. And I spent four hours sitting on the living room floor talking about that life and talking about his struggles, talking about the joys of his life, but also talking about these very dark moments uh, that, that he lived through in the final years of his life. And what struck me from that very first moment, one, you know, this is a family that is going through a tragedy that they will never get over. So the day they die, they will have to live with this and live with the pain of losing, you know, a son, a boyfriend who she expected to become her husband. Uh, You know, someone who was very loved, was a very positive influence in a lot of lives. But beyond that, it was like, I immediately recognized what Zach meant about where we stand in America in the 21st century. We love football. And by the way, I love football. This book is not a diatribe against football, not by any means. Uh, in part, it's almost a love letter to football. But it's also a, a cautious love letter that when you read Zach's story, you recognize, yes, we love this sport. And we see all the rewards that it gives. That it gives. I mean, here in, in the upper Midwest, down in Texas, and all of America loves the sport of football. But we now see that it can, you know, playing football can be 
a little more dangerous than just having a bum knee for the rest of your life or a bad shoulder. This can be really hit at what it makes us to be human. Uh, not to say that football should go away, uh, just to say that we should be very cautious about it. And I remember that very first time that I hung out with Zach Sam. Um, I mean, this was all so fresh to them. And the whole time we're talking, right behind me on the television, that favorite team, the Green Bay Packers, are playing his father's favorite team, the Minnesota Vikings. And every single man in that room, myself included, by the way, sneaking looks at the game, checking the score. Uh, we're looking at our phone, check our fantasy football score. Even as we're talking about, as Brendan Easter is speaking about the sport that killed my son, we still love football. Even in that dying days, he still loves football. Even as he's blaming the sport for his demise, he's still watching Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers play on Thanksgiving night. So I think there's something very you know, subtle. There's a lot of grave in this story because we do love this sport, but at the same time, especially the parent of two young boys, I, I have some very grave concerns about this sport. You thrive on long form stories covering from COVID to elections. How heartbreaking was it for you to read Zach's diaries and that 39 page document labeled concussions, my silent struggle. It was devastating. It was absolutely devastating. And frankly, the most devastating parts of reading those diaries and of interviewing his friends and his family and his coaches and his classmates, uh, the most devastating part had to do with his relationship with his father. Maybe that's because I'm a dad myself, and I've spent so much time putting myself in my Easter's shoes. Uh, or maybe because I, I think he is, in a way, the most tragic character in this book outside of that. Uh, Miles Easter was, you know, what you think of as a man's man. This, this is a family from, from rural Iowa out in the cornfields of the Kindle. They've been there for, for seven generations, since before the Civil War, when this family homesteaded in Iowa, before it was even a state. And they still have that land. They still go deer hunting on that land with all of winter. Uh, and Miles Easter, I mean, he is what you think of as a man's man. He's not someone who's going to go to therapy and say, I need to work these out. But he's absolutely tortured by his son's death because he feels that he had some sort of role in it. He was a football coach. He was a uh, coach at a small college in Iowa. He played Division One football himself uh, for Drake University in Des Moines. And then he was also the defensive coordinator for the high school team in this small town. And all three of his sons played for him. Uh, I think, in a way, the one solace that his father takes is that when Zach graduated from high school in 2010, that was just as all this talk about concussions and contact sports, not just football. Uh, we could talk about numerous sports that are affected by this, but I think football is the most prominent and, and the one where it was most baked into the sport. Uh, these issues are just becoming in the news, and people are just learning about it. Miles Easter can plead ignorance in a way that I think parents today cannot. Uh, he didn't know, and he can be honest, but he didn't know, people didn't know about what concussions, and by the way, what sub concussive hits, which I think are so much more dangerous because they, you don't flag those as, uh, you don't get a 15 yard penalty for a sub concussive hit. You might get one for, for targeting, but you, you know, sub concussive hits are very much safe as football. Miles Easter didn't know. We didn't know as a country, as, as fans, as parents, as athletes. We didn't know what this meant. Uh, now we sort of do. Uh, the science is still very young about this. We're not talking about an issue that's going to be uh, coming out, you know, going to be solved in a year or two. We're talking about 20 or 30 years. Uh, we've, we've seen, I think, with COVID, how long science can take, even when the whole world is behind it. We're still, you know, we hope there's going to be a vaccine in winter. We don't really know. Uh, but uh, I think with concussion, this is, you know, the, the brain is the most mysterious and complicated object uh, in the universe that we know of in the known universe. 
And uh, it, it, it's something that scientists are very much working on, but very much have not solved. That, to me, is what's most scary about that. Where did Zach get the concept of playing through the pain? Was it a coach, uh, his father? And how did it change his life? So people in this small town refer to the Easter mentality. Uh, and this is the mentality of the Easter family that you're, you're a real man. You don't complain. His brother, uh, his older brother, who also played uh, college football, uh, went on to play college football. He fractured his vertebrae during a high school game and he kept on playing. Uh, that's what you do because it's football. Uh, this is the Easter mentality, but it's also, this is why, look, this is why football can be dangerous because you play through the pain and it's one thing playing through a sprained ankle. It's another thing playing through a bruised brain. Uh, but this is one reason that we love football. This is what football you know, historically has been a, a, a sport that is so aligned with American power, America's rise as a superpower, with American military might. Uh, if you look at when football came about, it came about right after the Civil War. As America grew as a nation and became a world power, so did football grow as our national sport. I don't think anyone would argue right now that baseball is still, is, is still the favorite sport in America. And that's been around for 60 or 70 years. It is, of course, football. And it's because we see football as a sport where you rub dirt in it and take a lap, where we value toughness more than anything else. When the strength or speed, we value toughness. And that's what the Eastern mentality is in a nutshell. It is, you don't complain, you're a man, you get out there and do your job. And by the way, like, I know we can refer to that as, as toxic masculinity these days, uh, and sometimes it is, but other times there's, I think, great value in some of those lessons that we can learn from sports like football that, that hey, life's hard, you're going to go through some adversity, you pick up and get through it. Uh, that, to me, is both the great part of football, and at the same time, it's the it's the scary part of football, especially when it has to do with the brain. Because you know you don't have an X-ray that can say you have a broken brain. Uh, you, you have that for an arm. No one's gonna if you have a broken arm. No one's gonna look at you sideways and be like, "Why is he not playing?" And be like, "Oh, he has a broken arm." With the brain, it, it's just a wholly different thing, and that's where I do think there is a destructive side to this this up and up mentality that is, you know, the core tenet of football. Reed Forgrave, author of Love, Zach, joins us beyond the mic. Reed, did Zach lose hope with his brain pretty much being broken? Yeah, 100%. You can see it in his writing. Uh, he, so it, it's really a remarkable document. But he had not just the foresight to leave these writings behind, but that he had the mental faculties to be able to document what he's going through. You can see in his writing, it'll be like June 10th, 2015. Today was a good day. I'm so excited about trying to beat this. Allie, my girlfriend, is going to help me out. I'm so positive. Two days later, I drove to a therapy appointment. I sat in the parking lot for an hour. I couldn't go in. I can't beat this point. I was driving home to my childhood home and got lost on a drive that I've made a thousand times before. It's devastating to watch in real time. And he's hanging back and forth between these emotions. But ultimately, yeah, he's completely lost hope. Um, which to me is incredibly sad, but maybe he's sad as part of this entire story because he had family in his corner. He had a heroic girlfriend in his corner. Uh, did they fully understand what he is? He is like CTE, what it is? No, they didn't. Uh, but they started to come around and realize their son was going through something really, really difficult. What makes me most sad about him losing hope is that I don't want to say he could have beat this degenerative brain disease, but he could have managed it. Uh, there are, would he have, you see in his journals again and again and again where he says, I just wish. I was the old Zach Easter again. Why can't I be the old unloving Zach? He was, he was the jock who everyone loved and he loved everyone. Uh, he wasn't that, he wasn't a bully. He was, you know, the character 
the, his nickname was Ode, which was named after the, that friendly dog in the Battlefield comic strip, Odie. Uh, that was that. Just everyone loved him. He saw that he couldn't be that same kid. He still could have been a successful and productive human being. Uh, he would have had to work at it. Uh, he was working at it. He was going to uh, speech pathologist to work on memory trips to improve his memory. He was a different human being because of it. He was forever changed, but he wasn't forever destroyed. And, and that is what is so sad that he saw himself as a lost cause. He was a different Zachy kid, but he could have still become a productive and I believe happy Zachy sir. Uh, and frankly, I think the canning of this is, is key that this is so early in, if you want to call it a concussion epidemic, uh, if you just want to call it like the, what we're learning about the ways the concussions affect the human brain, that story came so early in this. If that story was 20 years from now, I think we'd have some, some, uh, you know, medications and therapies that are proven, uh, to help this. So at this point, we don't, and that's that's where he lost it. Let's cut to the million dollar question: What do you believe needs to be done to save more men like Zach? Yeah, it's it is the million dollar question. If I answered it, I'd get a lot more than a million dollars. Uh, that's essentially chapter ten, the final chapter of my book. Like, what is the future here? What is the future of football, and what is the future for people like Zach? If you talk to Dr. Bennett Amalu, who you know his name because he is one of the most prominent researchers behind CTE and its connection with football. Uh, you may know him as Will Smith, who played him in the movie Concussion. If you talk with him, he is uh, sort of an absolutist in this. He says we, the way to solve this is to say you're not allowed to play football until age 18. Why you know, tackle uh, full contact football? Uh, why age 18? Because that is, one, the age of consent, and two, it's the age uh, that, you know, the, brain, the, the human brain is close to fully developed at that point. Uh, so you don't have these, these, these young brains that are being specified. I'll look at that and say, well, you know, you do that, and a generation or two from now, and, and football, if not gone away completely, it'll be completely marginalized because that ruins the pipeline, it kills high school football. You're not going to see high schoolers excited about playing for the varsity flag football team. Uh, and eventually that pipeline will affect college football and the pro. Maybe it becomes like boxing, where it's a niche sport. Uh, maybe it goes away. Uh, to me, that's not realistic. Just knowing how much America loves this sport. To me, I think, oh, look, there have been very serious measures taken, you know, from all the way up to the NFL, all the way down to Pop Warner football, about taking the head out of the game, legislating out that unnecessary rough, whether it's a 15 yard penalty or whether it's you get kicked out of the game at the first, uh, you know, vicious helmet to helmet contact that you have. Uh, I think those are all good and well. And I know if you're an old school football fan, you cringe that this sport is being, as Zach's father said, that it's being pacified. But it's an existential question for football. You need to legislate that out. Uh, the bigger question to me is some can Uh You can't legislate this out of the game if you want this game to remain anywhere close to the sport that we know and love in America. Uh, a lot of scientists will say that they believe some concussive hits are a bigger predictor of CTE than uh, actual concussion. Some concussive hits being like the smaller hits that happen more often uh, and that just pile up over time. For someone like that, I, what I would hope is that the way that we understand how to manage post-concussion life uh, becomes more defined. Uh, Zach's family founded a foundation in his honor. It's called CTE Hope Foundation. I encourage you to check it out online. And they're helping to fund some very serious scientific research. And one thing that Zach's mother is most excited about is a saliva study that they're helping fund in the state of Iowa. But basically, the goal for this, and it may not be for a decade or two, it can actually be realized. But the goal is 
have a sideline spit test. You, you spit after half of suffering a big hit, and there's proteins in that spit that can say yes or no. This, this young man, this boy, had a concussion. No, he did not have a concussion. And then instead of the guesswork, where a doctor says, well, your eyes are a little bit all over the place, you, you don't seem right, it appears that you have a concussion, they can say, you know, we, you know, a degree of definitiveness that we don't have right now. They can say yes or no, you do or don't have a concussion. That's a ways off. And for someone like that right now, uh, I would say for, for parents, it's just a matter of like, be cautious, watch your kids closely. Uh, just because you get one concussion doesn't mean that you're going to end up like that. But no means is that the case. But once you have that first concussion, that's where I think you need to be extremely cautious because once you get that first one, it's like the seal is broken and it's a lot easier to get a second one. And you know, to, to, to a more you know, immediate degree, if you have a concussion right now and you go right back in the football game, that's where you're in the danger zone. And if you get another one 10 minutes later, that's where things can be really destructive. So trainers uh, and coaches and parents, they need to take this stuff very, very seriously. I'm not saying that to the kid in bubble wrap, uh, but I am saying watch them closely when they're playing sports like this. You have sons. Will you let them play football? Gosh, I say no right now. Uh, I have a four-year-old and eight-year-old. And I might not have a say in the matter because my wife says no much more strongly than I do. But it's different saying no in theory when I have a four-year-old. What, what is it like in 10 years when all his friends are playing football? And when I've been watching the Minnesota Vikings lose every Sunday afternoon with him downstairs, you know, for a decade, when he comes to me and he's dad, you love football. Why can't I play this sport? It's a different discussion. My answer right now is no, but it depends where the science is. And, you know, there's a doctor in this book. Sorry to take a little aside. There's a doctor in this book who treated Zach. He's an incredibly impressive doctor, specialized in concussions. He was in the U.S. Navy and ran a concussion hospital in Afghanistan for about eight months. Uh, that had this is very successful work, and he's replicating it in Iowa. Just opened the clinic last month, in fact. And, and the point of the clinic is that it brings together lots of different disciplines uh, to us. It's not just, hey, I'm a primary care doctor, but hey, I'm a speech therapist, hey, I'm a neuroscientist, hey, I'm a sports, uh, sports trainer. Bring all these together to treat it. I asked him, he has sons who are a little bit older than me, and he was wondering, as recently as six months ago, whether one of his kids was going to play football and the kid really wanted to play tackle football. And this doctor had played tackle football all the way through high school and he was right. He was like, it was the best times of my life. We were a terrible team and it didn't matter one bit because of the bonding that he had there. And what this doctor went at, who knows concussions more than anyone else uh, that I've ever met, he's like, I'm going to leave it up to my son. I'm going to push him toward other sports. But if ultimately he wants to play football, we are going to go play football. And we're going to be very cautious about it. We're going to keep a strong iron. If he, gets, if he suffers one of these big hits, we will pull him out uh, until he's better or perhaps permanently. I think that, to me, it, it, is really telling. That's a, a doctor who knows more about this uh, than just about anyone was willing to cautiously say yes to his son. This one decided on soccer, by the way, which is another sport that, especially with headers, there is risk of concussion not as much as football. Uh, but he was willing to put his son out there and just say, we're going to watch him very closely. Did you ever reach a point in writing Love, Zach, where you broke down and cried, where you just said, I can't do this anymore? I reached... Yeah, I reached a dozen of those points. Uh... I think when you're a journalist in a book like that, ultimately you have to be, have a, a bit of an emotional, uh, remove from it where it's like, okay, I, whether Zach's family loves this book or hates this book, uh, is not the point. I need to tell his story accurately and impactfully in a way that reaches 
as big of an audience as possible because that's what Zach wanted. I think that's the point of a book like this. That said, when you're reporting this book, I'm not at a remove. I'm crying on the phone with Brenda Easter. I'm sitting drinking beers with his mom and dad uh, deep into the night on the kitchen table. And Brenda's yelling at me because I'm kind of making excuses for football. And she's like, this is the sport that killed my son. How can you be a fan anymore? Uh, I think the parts that impacted me most, it's kind of going back to what I said earlier, we're, we're the father-son thing. Uh, his dad has taken this so hard, and yet I think on the surface you wouldn't be able to tell because what's his way of, of therapy? It's not to sit inside with you. It's to go out, grab a couple beers, go on a walk with his dogs and his with a shotgun in their backyard and go hunt. Uh, that's his therapy. You wouldn't know this, but when you get to this deeper level and, and hearing of a father who did his darndest to create, to turn a boy into what he believed a man should be, and there's a big part of that that, that, that he believes played into this, uh, that played into his act of destruction. It's so painful to see. I'm nothing like Miles Easter, if you gave me a shot, and you know, watch out. I'm, uh, I'm, he's a, he's a cartoon character with like the two shotguns. I'd be like him, just like piling him in the air. I have no idea what I'm doing. But in a way, I, ident- I identified with him in a deeper way than any other character in this book because it's just so real. The feeling that a father has towards his son, the feeling that I want to protect him, but I know he needs to be out there in the world and be strong and suffer through some bad things in order to learn about life. Uh, that's the story of football, right? That's why we love this sport, why we think this sport helps turn boys into men. And it's also the danger of this sport at the same time, which is really a, a in a way, what the book lands on is football is not the worst thing ever. Football is not the best thing ever. Football is, and it's also not in the middle. It's both the best and the worst. It's the best sport that there is, and it's the scariest sport that there is. Award-winning sports writer, author, father, our friend Reed Forgrave joins us beyond the mic. If you could tell Zach and players like Zach who are suffering right now something, what would it be? You may never be the same because of these concussions uh, and because of the way that it affects you, but you can still be something incredibly, uh, you know, successful in life, incredibly satisfying in life. You can still lead a good life, even if it's not the life that you may have once imagined for yourself, even if you are different as a human being. There are lots of things that affect us uh, in our lives that change the trajectory of our life, whether it's a tragedy or whether it's a, some incredibly serendipitous thing that happened in college. Uh, things change all cats. This was something that changed that path. It didn't mean that there was no hope for him. It meant that he had to figure out different ways to, uh, you know, to become successful. He maybe had to work a little bit harder at it, but it didn't mean that there was no hope at all. Uh, there was. It just looked a little bit different. Now, have you been in touch with Zach's former girlfriend, Allie? And uh, how is she doing right now? She's good. Um, she has so the blessing in Zach's death. If you can think of it, you know, the silver lining in, in such a dark, dark cloud is that he left behind these writings, and in those writings, he left behind very explicit instructions to Allie, to his family. To, to spread his word, to spread his story, and to kind of further his legacy. And Allie has taken that, so it's so his parents, uh, taken that and run with it. Uh, whether it's through this foundation or whether it's just simply through you know, working on this book together with me. Uh, they, Allie has graduated from a prestigious law school, Case Western Reserve in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and she now works for a high flying law firm in New York City. And yet, his law firm has, has helped her do pro bono work. Uh, in that, in his text messages with her, you see all these times where he's so proud of her. He's like, you're going to be the first female president. There's so much pride in 
in his girlfriend and in what she could be. And she is becoming that. She's a really impressive person who is, I don't want to say moving on in life, but moving through this game and trying to both remember Zach's legacy and make that part of who she is uh, forever and recognizing she has to live life as well. She's in a serious relationship. She has a boyfriend now, but she also has, after Zach's death, uh, he left behind an envelope of money for her. It was, it was his last paycheck from a, uh, it was like a, a gardening gig that he did over the summer, like a lawn service gig. And it was $1,400. And she took part of that money and she had a ring made uh, that, that has Zach both things in it. And for her, it's very much like a wedding ring. She thinks of herself as a widow. Uh, she took the rest of that money and guess what she did? I think this is such a metaphor for the way that we feel about football. She took the rest of that money and one year after Zach's death, drove with his best friend and his college roommate, he drove to Lambeau Field and watched a Packers game the day before Christmas. Uh, they watched it together. And it was her way to pay honor to him. And it was also really painful for her. Well, she has a very complicated relationship with the sport of football. But she also recognized football's not going away. So she becomes one of those people who says, you know, kind of an extremist about it. And there are plenty of extremists out there who say, you know, we must eliminate football. The sport must, uh, must no longer exist. No one's going to listen to her, not the America. Uh, but she recognizes that there is good to be done for the story. And, uh, it's really inspiring. And without, without Zach's writing, uh, without those encouraging his family, without them giving it, his family such a charge, this this never would have been a book. Uh, I do see this book as, in a way, it's carrying out Zach's last wish. Well, my friend, time's running out, so it's time for the Rocky Nate. Eight random questions. Answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. <laughs> there is no pressure. I'm feeling the pressure. <laughs> What's your favorite band t-shirt? Pearl Jam. Um, that's my favorite band of all time. I have a t-shirt from them from uh, the mid-90s, and... Uh, just, just heard a Pearl Jam song on the radio this morning when I was driving my kid to daycare. Last sporting event you attended? Sporting event? I've covered sports for so long, but then the past year I haven't. Whoa, blah, 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 blah. It might have been, it was probably a Twins game last year, but the last one that mattered and it was really fun and it was memorable was uh, 2019 NBA Finals. Uh, Toronto Raptors and Kawhi Leonard. I was covering the NBA for CBS Sports. That was a Absolutely incredible times. What was the name of your first car? <laughs> Geo Prism. I called it Geoey. That was uh, that was the car's name. It was a really bad attempt at a good car nickname. Coffee or tea? Coffee. So much coffee. My goodness. Stop the coffee already. What's the hobby you picked up during COVID? Um, the hobby. I, I briefly was doing some baking. Uh, which did not go well. Uh, but the hobby that I'm planning to pick up this winter, since I live here in Minnesota, and COVID has been, the blessing of COVID has been, it has been during the nice month, but any day now, winter's going to come. We bought uh, skis for myself, my wife, and my two boys. And they've never been skiing before. And I've decided every single weekend this winter, and hopefully some afternoons and evenings after school, we will go skiing. Because otherwise, I'm just going to get incredibly depressed during the incredibly long and cold Minnesota winter. Now, when will the next time Mizzou will win a non wrestling conference championship? <laughs> next question. <laughs> Come on, man. I don't know. Like, like, like uh, my alma mater is so depressing. Like, I remember like one time we were ranked number one in football in like 2007. It lasted a week and then we got smoked by Oklahoma the next week. Uh, I don't want to be a Missouri fan, but like it's better than the one pro team that I grew up rooting for, which was I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, as a Stephen Brown diehard fan. So anything is an upgrade from that, including being a Missouri sports fan. As a Cleveland Browns fan, I salute you. I was there for the drive. The worst part was the Muni didn't have urinals. They had troughs. And they were so close. The first football game I ever went to, my uncle took me to me. Municipal Stadium in, I think it was 1989, Brown Cowboys were their the, the opener, and we sat behind a big gross cement pole, because that's 
in the stadium. But it ended up being, and I looked this up like a year or two ago, I'd be like, what happened during that game? I don't really remember it. It was Bill Belichick's first game as a coach, and it was Emmett Smith's first game as a rookie. I had no idea like the history that was happening before me because it was just depressing municipal stadium, but uh, and being a depressing grandparent, cursing for life. What's your favorite family holiday story? You know what? It might be last uh, last Christmas. And I know that like, usually you think these holiday stories would be like when you're growing up. Um, and like my dad building the train around the Christmas tree, which he did. It was always disappointing that I wasn't more interested in it. But last Christmas, we went to the Caribbean to an island called Bonaire. <laughs> and so one of these, and it was beautiful and it was like our first time doing a Caribbean vacation and it might be you know the last vacation that we ever take because COVID is going to be everything forever and ever and ever but we on, on Christmas uh, I think it was the day before Christmas we went to a donkey preserve and drove around the donkey preserve in a pickup truck and like it's really like hundreds of donkeys and feeding them carrots and they're getting up in the face and uh, that's like the number one Christmas memory from Christmas 2019. And then like a week later, COVID appeared out in China. In social media, you say you're calmer than you are. When was the last time you weren't calm? Uh, when I had too much caffeine. That line is uh, from the best movie of all time, which I've told each of my sons for their 16th birthday, they get to watch the big Lebowski uh, with their father, with me. Uh, but calmer than you are is what uh, the dude says in the uh, in the coffee shop when he's getting getting yelled at by the uh, by the waitress. Last time when I wasn't calm was probably yesterday when I was yelling at my kids about something stupid and they were fighting. Like, welcome to parenthood. I'm no longer calm than anything. The dude divides. <laughs> Such a good movie. <laughs> he's got great memories of a donkey preserve. Remembers the troughs at. Memorial Stadium in Cleveland and drinks way too much coffee. His latest book is The Touching and Heartbreaking Love Zach. It's our friend Reed Forgrave. Reed, thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you so much for having me. This is really fun. And that, my friends, is Beyond the Mic. <laughs>